Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome here. Please stand and join us as we worship our Father in heaven. someone next to you and welcome them to church today.
Thou hast been. 
house when rocks cry out to worship whose glory taught the stars to shine perhaps creation longs to have the words to say but this joy is mine song is forever yours a thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more who else would die for our redemption whose resurrection means our rise there isn't time Sing of all you've done, but I have eternity to try. With a thousand hallelujahs, we magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever. in this place for you are worthy 
praise to you alone, King of Kings. We thank you for your goodness and your love for us today. And we just are turning that back to you in praise. Help us to continue to worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can have a seat and the ushers will come forward and collect the offering and just invite up Phil Pudlis for an update. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, Westwood. Good to see you here this morning. My name is Phil, last name Pudlis, and this morning I am representing the men's ministry in the church. Those of you who don't know, uh, we, we meet every Wednesday morning for breakfast we meet to pray, we meet to uh, look into the Word, we enjoy a good breakfast together. And the men do things. And we might be most known for our ladies' night out that we've hosted for several, several years. The men get together and they bless the women of Westwood with a fancy, dancy evening. All men, men singers, men servers, men cooks, men, men, men. Well, the guys, yeah, a little shout out for the men there. The guys this year have uh, decided to put a little twist on our event. And rather than blessing the women of Westwood, we are going to bless our women neighbors downtown this year. So what does that mean? We are taking the event downtown. Um, oh, good. There's a nice little info slide behind me. We're, we're putting on a fun event, including a meal, fun activities. There will be a speaker. All the usual things that were present at the, the women's night out, we're just moving downtown with it. And we're also asking help from everyone, men and women and youth of our church. We want to team together uh, to pull this off. So, how come I'm wearing a backpack? You see my backpack? It's a very good question. One of the things we're going to do this year is we're going to set up a Christmas tree this week. And the Christmas tree is going to have lovely heart ornaments on it. And on each ornament is a list of items. And our challenge to the church is going to be, get a backpack. You'll, you'll provide the backpack. Pick an ornament that has a number on it. And go home and fill up the backpack and then bring it back to church. During the event that's going to happen downtown... Each woman that, woman that attends will be receiving a backpack full of goodies. There's a suggested list, but by no means do you have to stick to that list. We've got 100 ornaments that we're going to put up on a tree. You'll see it set up next week. And our challenge is for you as individuals, for you as families, for you as small groups, to grab an ornament or 10. Get to work on filling them up. And then bring them back to the church and we'll have them ready for the event. There's going to be more information coming. Of course, we can't pull this off uh, just with a few people. We'll have lots of volunteer opportunities that we're going to share in, uh, in the days to come. Uh, lots of uh, opportunities ahead. We hope that you'll partner with the men. And now it's going to be women and youth uh, together to... Uh, be a blessing of love to our women neighbors downtown. Amen? Amen. Welcome. Thank you, Phil. Good morning, everyone. Well, before I jump in, I just want to say I'm really excited that this is happening. I'm really excited that our church is partnering together um, 
for this opportunity of bringing more shalom in our community, um, bringing more of God's peace and thriving. And so I really encourage you uh, to get involved and to be part of that. So for those of you that don't know, my name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here. I oversee uh, GO, which is our local and global mission. And then I also partner with Pastor Robin in overseeing our micro churches, our small expression of the church. Um, and if you're curious about what those are, come talk to me after or Pastor Robin, and we'd love to talk to you. It's just a way of getting connected with other believers and going on a discipleship journey together where you can encourage one another, be in community with one another, and serve together. And so I encourage you to, to think about uh, what it looks like to be part of that. So this morning... I'm continuing in our series where we're examining different parts of our confession of faith that maybe we don't talk about so much uh, and digging in a little bit on saying, what does this mean? What is this about? And so this morning, I am going to be speaking about work, rest, and the Sabbath. And in order to do that, we are going to go, literally, but cover to cover in Scripture. Don't worry, I'm not reading the whole thing. I would have had to have asked you to bring sleeping bags and the whole bit then. But we are going to go on a journey of like, what does God say about work? What does he say about rest? What does he call us to do? And how does he call us to live in light of these things? And in order to do that, though, if we're going to talk about rest and Sabbath, uh, first of all, we can't understand the value of Sabbath rest unless we first recognize the value of work. And in order to do that, we are going to start at the very beginning in Genesis 1 and just see what does God begin to show us about work and the value of work, and then what does he say about rest and how we should enter into that. So, Genesis 1. Let's jump in together. And we're, and we're going to start at verse 26. So, a uh, little context is this is a creation story. God has created all these different things. Um, and now um, he is about to create human beings. So verse 26, he says this. It says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock and over the earth and everything that moves along the ground. God bless them and said, to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. Okay, so let's move down a little bit further uh, to chapter 2. And then he says this, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So God does all this creating, then he rests. But I want us to take note of a verse right before he rests, because I think it really um, shows us, begins to show us what is the value of this Sabbath that Scripture talks about. Verse 31 of chapter 1 says, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. It was very good. So, a few things here. When God is about to create human beings, he says, let us, talking about the Trinity, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He says, let us create human beings in our image. So think about that for a minute. What does it mean to be created in the image of God? Well, one of the things when we read Scripture that we should always think about is what is the context, what is going on around the verse that we are trying to understand. Um, because if we just take, pick verses out and isolate them, we can make Scripture say all kinds of things. So what is the context that God is saying, let's make humans in our image? The context is the context of creation. So what does that tell us then? about being made in the image of God. Well, I think part of what Scripture is trying to show us here is that being made in the image of God is to be a co-creator with Him. Now, think about this. Think about all the different things God made in creation, 
And all of them have different aspects of being able to change their environment and to some degree create things, you know. But there is something about human beings where we are able to create absolutely astounding things. Like, think about it. You, probably most of you drove here in a car. I mean, think about how complex that is, all the creativity that took, the building of knowledge from generation upon generation to get us even to the place where we could build a car and build road networks and drive and get places. Like places that would have taken days to get to, um, now we can do it in an hour. Like pretty incredible how God has wired us to co-create and make things, to change <laughs> the possibilities of what was possible, like things that seemed impossible maybe a hundred years ago now are totally possible. God has made us as co-creators, and so I want us to understand this because I think if we understand that we are co-creators like with God, then we will begin to see that all of our work, no matter how mundane you might think it might be, all of our work has value. Because when we do our work, we are co-creating often with God and contributing with others and co-creating with them and God. And we're going to get to what, what can happen when that happens a little bit later. But before that, I want us to stop and pause and remember this, too, when we think about work. What does God say when he finishes all his work? He says, it is very good. God loved his work and took delight in it. You know, sometimes we think, yeah, work, for some of us, we might think, ah, work is like a necessary thing that we do so that we can live the rest of life. No. Work is meant to be something that we can take delight in. And sometimes that's easier said than done, right? And we're going we're gonna, to, as we continue in Scripture, we're going to see why work is harder now and why work doesn't always feel like a delight. But I want us to recognize that God took delight in his work. And so it's okay for us to take delight in our work and enjoy our work. Now, it says then on the seventh day that God rested from his work. And Sabbath, this idea of Sabbath, which is originally instituted here in Genesis, Sabbath literally means to stop, like literally translated. But it can also mean to delight. Like, isn't that awesome? Like, it means to stop, but it also can mean to delight. And, and so sometimes when we think about Sabbath, if we've heard of this idea of Sabbath, of resting on the seventh day, taking a day of rest in, in every week, we can think, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe we have a, a, an experience where we grew up with a lot of rules around that, some of us. And, and this isn't the point, and we're going to see this as we see how did Jesus wrestle with Sabbath a little bit later? How did he express it? That, there, that it's supposed to be this idea of Sabbath rest is supposed to be a delight. So when you think about what you might do with this Sabbath, this day of rest, I want you to ask yourself this question. What could I do to fill up my soul with joy and delight? What would give me life? What would fill me? What would make me feel joy? How could I incorporate that into my practice of Sabbath? Now, the other thing I want us to recognize in this early part of Genesis is that God gave humans the work of co-creating with him. We already talked about that. But he also gave them this work of stewarding and cultivating, right? He, he says to them, um, sometimes it's translated rule, but the idea is like you are to, to oversee creation and take care of it and cultivate it so it can thrive. That's, that's the idea here. So God actually is the one that gives humans something to do. He's the one that initiates this idea of work. But the problem is, if we, if we were to read a little further in Genesis and get into Genesis chapter 3, 
is human beings choose to rebel against God. And in so doing, human beings make things much more difficult when it comes to this whole idea of work. If we go to Genesis chapter 3, and we go to verse 17, this is some of the results that we hear of what happens when humans chose to rebel against God. It says, cursed is the ground because, you, because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it. Toil, that doesn't sound like delight. All the days of your life, and it will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and dust you will return. So when we chose to rebel against God, that's when this when toil and, and, and work becoming hard and not always a delight came into the picture. Sometimes, some of you may, can relate to this because you go to work and work doesn't always feel like a delight. Sometimes it feels like a toil. It feels like uh, something to endure. Something that isn't easy. It's hard. It's challenging. It's not the way that work was intended to be. Work was intended to be a delight. But when we chose to rebel against God and, and all of creation suffered as a result, this whole thing of toil coming into it and work sometimes being hard and challenging and sometimes we wonder, well, what's the point of all this? That's where this entered the picture. Humanity's rebellion made both work and taking delight in work more difficult. So now, if we fast forward in the story of Scripture a little bit, we get to this group of Hebrew people and they're living in slavery in Egypt. And they've been living, in, and the conditions keep getting worse and worse. And they say, okay, we used to give you straw, now you have to go find your own straw. You know, we used to give you this, now you have to do this. I know yesterday our production uh, standards were here, now they're here. But you still have the same amount of time to do it. Like, they were being worked hard, no days off, none of that, just work, work, work. Poor conditions, just do it. And it, enter into this, God sends Moses to help set this group of people free. And they get into the desert, and they're worried about food, and God provides, you know, quail to come for them to eat, and manna, this bread for them to eat. And then he says to them, he reminds them of this whole idea of Sabbath practice, and he says to them, hey, take the seventh day off. And like you would think after years of slavery, they'd be like, yes, finally a day off. Oh, we've been working so hard for so long. Finally, a day off. You'd think that they would rejoice in that. You'd think that they would be happy for that. However, Scripture says this. If we go to Exodus chapter 16, okay, God tells them, hey, collect extra, collect extra manna from heaven the day before and do everything you need to prepare it so that it's ready to eat the next day. And he tells them, don't go out and collect on the seventh day. In fact, I won't even provide any manna on the seventh day, so don't bother. It's supposed to be a day of rest. Take the day off. But verse 27 says, Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. And God has to remind them again through Moses, Remember, I told you this. Take the day off. You need it. Here's what I want us to understand from this. If we become a slave to our work we will have a hard time entering in to the freedom of Sabbath. God gives us Sabbath as a gift. But sometimes, you know, for, sometimes we can undervalue work, but sometimes we can become so all-consumed with work 
that God offers us the freedom of entering into Sabbath, and we just say, Dad, I don't, I don't have time for that. I can't do that. And yet God calls us to do it, not, not as a command, not as a burden, but as something to rejuvenate us for something that is meant for our thriving. See, Sabbath, actually, it's an act of trust. It's about saying, yeah, there's always more work to be done. Like, who can relate? Who, who gets to the end of their work week and goes, well, I don't think there's much, I don't think there's any more work. I'm done. Right? There's more work. The next day, there's more work. You, no matter how hard you work, no matter how many hours you work in a day, guess what? The next day, there's still more work to do. Most of the time, Right? So Sabbath is an act of trust. Sabbath is saying, God, I trust that you saying that me taking a day off is for my best interest, and I'm going to trust you that if I set this aside for a day, that you'll provide, you will take care of me, and it'll be there the next day. It's an act of trusting that what God says is best for us is actually best for us. You know, the whole, the whole rebellion back in Genesis 3 was human beings being tricked into thinking that maybe God didn't have their best intentions at heart, right? And it's continued, this idea of, well, I don't know, can I really trust that, will it really be okay if I take the day off? This is what God says. He says, this is for your best interest. And in fact, science is starting to prove this. They've done all kinds of studies lately that have shown that there is no distinguishable difference in productivity between people who work 70 hours a week and 50. You're like, well, that doesn't make sense. They work 20 more hours. They should be able to produce more. Here's why they don't. The more and more your hours pile up, what happens? You get tired. You make more mistakes. Your productivity goes down and down until suddenly you're just trying to survive. And then you think, well, the solution to this is like, well, I'll just work more hours. I just won't take a day off. And it becomes this vicious cycle and you get more and more worn down. Sabbath is a blessing. It's for our own rejuvenation of our souls, of our bodies, of our minds. Sabbath is a way of resting in the fact that my value comes from being created in the image of God. Not by what I can produce, although what you can do is very valuable, and we're going to see out why as we continue, but from who I am. I am a child of God, and my value comes from that. God shows us in the creation account and is that your work is to put things in place so that you're then more able to enter into God's shalom and you're able to enter into rest and you're able to thrive the way that you're meant to thrive. So Sabbath rest is important. But I also want to encourage you that part of why this, this rest work cycle is so important is so that we can be at our best because actually I want to say to you that one of the most powerful tools for creating shalom is actually work. I want to tell you a a quick story. Some of you know Dave and Louise Sinclair Peters. Um, We we partner with them to do uh, work in Thailand um, and in Myanmar and one of the things um, that they got to help enter into was starting this coffee business, okay? Starting this coffee business. It's called Lighthouse Coffee. And now they're starting another one uh, called Bright Lantern Coffee. And here's the amazing thing that happens by starting business. You know, sometimes when we think missions, we think, oh, the, we have to just go there, we have to preach the gospel and plant churches. And don't get me wrong, that's important and that's part of their journey. But they completely changed entire communities. And here's how. They started these coffee businesses, and before, these farmers, because of needing to somehow support their families, a lot of them were growing opium. 
And, and a lot of them were living subsistence living, barely having enough to eat and get by on. And even the ones that were already growing coffee were getting paid a very poor wage and were barely surviving off of it. In they come, the farmer's income goes up four or five times. They're able to build infrastructure in the communities that the communities never had. They're, they're able to improve the school, get computers in the school, all of these kinds of things, right? And now, suddenly, uh, families can afford for their kids to go to school. A and families can afford to have the necessities of life, and then even a little bit, right? Their, their lives are changed. And then also, as they're doing this, they're sharing the gospel, and people's spiritual lives are transformed, and they become awakened to this relationship with God that they could have. Their entire, holistically, their entire world changes. And the main start of that was business, was, do, was giving them work that they could do, transformed an entire community. So I want you to understand that work <laughs> is a very valuable thing, but rest is a piece of that cycle as well. The two are meant to go hand in hand so that we can create these communities of shalom, these communities of human thriving. Because the idea of creating things together, be, being co-creators with God and with others, is that we'll work towards a culture of shalom, a culture that promotes holistic human thriving. So with all this in mind, let's skip a little bit further ahead in Scripture and ask ourselves the question, well, what did Jesus have to say about the Sabbath? What did Jesus say about this? Well, the interesting thing about this is that Jesus liked to get in trouble on the Sabbath, <laughs> right? You think, oh yeah, Jesus, he, he, he would have been all about the rules and adhered to the rules and all this. Jesus stirred the pot a little bit. He, he changed what the rule keepers and the religious leaders thought Sabbath was all about because they thought it was all about rules and making extra rules so you don't break the rules so that absolutely you do not do anything that could even resemble work on a Sabbath because that would be bad. And it became all about adhering to the rules and living in fear that somehow you might break a rule about the Sabbath. And Jesus realizes that that's not what the Sabbath is all about. So he he pokes them a little bit on this, and he stirs the pot a little bit on this. Jesus was a bit of a pot stirrer at times. Mark chapter 2, verse 23. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, have you never heard, never read, sorry, what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abithar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is unlawful, which is, sorry, which is lawful only for priests to eat, and he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. He's saying, look, you got it backwards. You're living in a way where it's all about man being made for the Sabbath, and it's all about adhering and making sure you don't break any possible rule or rules about rules on the Sabbath. You got it backwards. The Sabbath was created for human beings to delight in and, and to to experience delight in their relationship with God and with each other and to rest and to do things that feed and fill your soul. It was never meant to be this life-sucking, rule-following thing. Jesus is like, you guys are missing it. But he doesn't finish there. If we continue reading, it says this. Another time, he went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. 
Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. And when Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. The Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. I mean, how dare someone heal somebody's shriveled hand on, on the day when you're not supposed to do any work? Like, imagine how twisted your thinking would have to be that your response to a man being miraculously healed of a shriveled hand that he's had for who knows how long is we got to kill this guy. He's causing trouble. How dare he break our rules? How dare he make somebody more whole? How dare he heal someone on the Sabbath? Jesus even says to them, what, what's the point? Is it, is it to do good or to do evil? They don't say anything because they know the answer, but they don't want to say it. Imagine that's your response, that you love rules more than you love human beings. But here's the thing. If we're really, really honest, some of us in the church are a bit like that, aren't we? We're all about the rules. We are rule lovers, some of us. And some of us, we're so worried about adhering to every last possible rule that we can think of and, and even rules about rules that we inadvertently start loving them more than we love people. And we can be a bit like the Pharisees where we care more about the rules than the human beings that the rules were created for. And Jesus reminds us in Scripture that the whole point of all the rules is this to love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, is it not loving your neighbor as yourself for them to be healed? They missed it. See, Jesus was doing things on the Sabbath that gave him and others joy and delight. The other thing he was accused of is always going to people's houses and having a little too much fun, <laughs> right? Joy and delight. Pharisees didn't like him for that either. See, Sabbath isn't about religiously following rules. Sabbath is a gift, a gift that's meant to promote our thriving. So, when you think about what, what can I do or what should I do if I take this, this Sabbath day of rest that you're talking about, that Scripture says I should do, how, how should I think about, how do I evaluate whether something is something I should or shouldn't do on that day? Think about it in this way. Is it life-giving? Does it feel like rest and worship? Because one person's idea of rest would, drive, would actually not be very life-giving for another. Like for one person, they, you know, maybe what would, what would refuel them, be restful, would be sitting by the fire in a comfortable chair with a nice cup of tea and just chilling. But if you're like me, you'd be done with that in about two minutes. Right? My idea of rejuvenation is running around like a crazy person on a soccer field for 90 minutes. That gives me life. That fills my soul. Right? Everybody's different, and, that, and that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying there's freedom to do what gives you joy and delight. That's the point. The point isn't about following this rule or that rule. The point is taking a rest from your usual, regular work to do something that feeds your soul. And, that, and making space 
for others and for God on that day. So think about it in that. It's not about, well, hmm, does this, have, does this constitute work or doesn't it? D- does it feel like rest and worship to you? Think about it through that lens. Is it life-giving? Is it a break from my usual? Sometimes, actually, what I would do when I used to work for the Salvation Army, uh, a few times I did this, and it was very life-giving for me. My, my work was a lot of, like, sometimes it would become very mentally and emotionally taxing because it was a lot of working with people and working with people through their problems and challenges that they were facing. And so one time, uh, what I did is I went uh, to this organic farm on our, on our island, a couple islands over. I had to take a few ferries to get there. And I just worked physically, hard physical labor all day, and that felt life-giving because it was totally different than my work. Something physical where I could actually see the progress of what I was doing that day was life-giving. And that was, that was a joy for me that day. So it's not about rules. It's about what will feed your soul, what will give you life. But the story's not over because we haven't got to Revelation yet. What does Revelation have to say about work and rest and this whole idea? Well, some interesting things that maybe you haven't thought of or heard of before. Revelation chapter 14, verses 13 and 14 say this. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor. Listen to this. For their deeds will follow them. What do you mean their deeds will follow them? Well, this seems to be hinting that somehow the work we do here has implications for the new creation that we'll spend eternity in. What's that about? Well, if we keep going to Revelation chapter 21, we see this vision of this new heaven and new earth and and heaven and God come down and they're living amongst human beings Not in a garden like we originally saw in the first creation, but a city. A city. And it's saying all the nations are a part of this city. And and then listen to what it says. It says, in verse 22, it says, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. And the Lamb is its lamp. Listen to this. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. Seems to be saying that the different cultures, the different nations, are somehow going to bring the things that are good and pleasing into that. That somehow the work in this broken world that is good or pleasing is going to be sanctified and redeemed and and somehow it's going to have a place in the new heaven and earth. And and so sometimes we've thought, I think actually very wrongly, that this idea of fire that we see that's going to consume and, and it's going to just destroy all the old earth and that's sometimes why Christians have been guilty about not caring about the environment, right? Yeah, it's just going to burn anyway. But here's the other thing about fire in Scripture. Often fire is actually not about destruction. It's about refining. And so this seems to hint at this idea that things will be refined. Anything that isn't right or pure about something will be refined, right? Because here's the thing. Sometimes humans create awesome things that have unintended side effects, right? We, we, we created cars, which made it super awesome for transportation we could get around anywhere. Uh, little did we know at the time, we were polluting the environment. Right? Like, we, we create all kinds of, like, incredible, awesome things, and then we realize, oh, shoot. <laughs> in, in creating something awesome, we also created a problem. It happens all the, and all the time. We could, I could stand up here and t- give you, like, example after example. But th- this seems to say, like, somehow... In the new creation, 
the aspect of that, anything that would cause destruction or suffering or pain or any of that, that's going to all be gone, but somehow our work has eternal value because somehow some of what we've worked and co-created with God is going to be in the new creation. And I don't understand how all that works or what the full implications of that, but I do think it's pretty amazing. Redeemed human culture seems to have a place in the new earth. Incredible. Oh yeah, sorry to burst anyone's bubble if you thought we were going to live in the clouds, you know, with Philly cream cheese. Sorry, it's not happening. Here's what Miroslav Volf says about it. I, I think this is a really incredible quote. He says this, The noble products of human ingenuity, whatever is beautiful, true, and good in human culture, will be cleansed from impurity, perfected and transfigured, to become part of God's new creation. They will form the building materials from which the glorified world will be made. Pretty incredible. If you want to read some more about this whole idea, I really encourage you to get this book, Garden City. It has some other incredible um, stuff around how we're going to spend eternity in a city, and it talks about, you know, work and rest and the art of being human. It's by John Mark Comer. There's several copies in our library. Check it out. Um, but I want to end by, by asking us a few questions for us to reflect on, and the worship team is going to come, and they're going to play a song, and just like the Sabbath and rest, is freedom. We're going to give you freedom to how you're going to participate in this. You can choose to just quietly listen to the words. You can choose to reflect and thoughtfully think through these questions. You can choose to join in and sing worshipfully to God. How you want to enter into this, we're giving you the freedom um, to choose. But I want to leave you, regardless of what you choose, how to choose to enter into this worship time, I want to leave you with a few questions to ponder as we close. In light of what we talked about today, what will work look like for you? Knowing that it has eternal value and worth and that it's an act of worship. Your work is an act of worship to God. What would it look like to work, to show up at work, to do your work, whatever it looks like, with this in mind, with this kind of mentality? Would that change the way you work? Think about that. Ponder that. Let me ask you this. What is God asking you to be part of co-creating with Him and with others? And finally, what will the practice of Sabbath look like in your life? Because you have the freedom to choose. So what will it look like in your life? In the chaos 
us in confusion I know you're sovereign still in the moment of my weakness you give me grace to do much for worshiping with us today. 